Good evening. I'm Max Rudin, president and publisher of Library of America, and welcome to LOA Live. Library of America is a nonprofit organization dedicated to publishing authoritative new volumes of great American writing and to keeping the many voiced American literary tradition a vital part of our culture. We're grateful for our partners uh, for this evening's event, the Association of Literary Scholars, Critics and Writers, Film Forum, Western Writers of America, the Old Caltown Museum, Roundup Magazine, the Writers Guild Foundation, and True West Magazine. A special welcome to the Library of America fellows and members who support our mission. Longing for a change of scenery after a year of pandemic? Well, you've come to the right place. Tonight's event considers the American Western, riveting stories of honor, lonely heroism, obsession, and violence set against the majestic landscapes of the American West. Two Library of America collections so far celebrate the genre. The Western, four classic novels of the 1940s and 50s, number 331 in the Library of America series, edited by Ron Hansen, and Elmore Leonard, Westerns, number 308 in the series, edited by Terence Rafferty, who joins us tonight. Why does the Western have such an enduring hold on the American imagination? How do these stories about the precariousness of community and the thin line between justice and vengeance speak to us today? Which great Western novels and films feel most alive and compelling now? Joining us to explore these and other questions are four distinguished critics who are passionate about both film and fiction. Terence Rafferty is writing for The New Yorker, The Atlantic, GQ, The New York Times, and many other places. It's collected in part in The Thing Happens, 10 years of writing about the movies. Gene Seymour, for 18 years film critic and jazz columnist at Newsday, is a frequent contributor to Book Forum, CNN.com, and The Washington Post. Imogen Sarah Smith's books include In Lonely Places, Film Noir Beyond the City. And she contributes regularly to the Criterion Collection and the Criterion Channel, Sight and Sound, Cineast, Reverse Shot, and many others. Our moderator, uh, next door here, is my longtime friend and colleague, Jeffrey O'Brien, the Editor-in-Chief Emeritus of Library of America. Poet, cultural historian, book and film critic, his many books include The Phantom Empire, Movies in the Mind of the 20th Century. Quick reminder that you can submit a question or comment at any time using the Q&A button on your menu bar. And if you do, please let us know where you're viewing from. And now, Please welcome Jeffrey O'Brien and our panel. Jeffrey. Hello, it's such a pleasure to be here with three wonderful writers, Terence Rafferty, Gene Seymour, Imogen Sarah Smith, to celebrate uh, the two books that Max just described, The Western, edited by Ron Hansen, and uh, last, uh, Elmore Leonard Westerns, edited by Terence Rafferty. Uh, the Ron Hansen volume, includes the novels, The Oxbow Incident, The Searchers, Shane, and Warlock. We, uh, we will be discussing the Western in, in many of its aspects. Uh, the Western, the most persistent of American genres has been declared dead or dying many times, but it always seems to come back uh, in new forms. Uh, it's what we have ended up with, uh, you might say, uh, in place of Homeric myths or Arthurian uh, cycles. Um, a common stock of tropes, images, situations, personas that can be endlessly reworked, recombined, and resituated in a history that they have always had uh, 
a, a tenuous relation to, let's say, a persistent but tenuous relation. And that, that the tenuousness of that relation is, is, is part of the fascination of the genre. Uh, it both is and is not uh, a history. Um, as Gene pointed out in his brilliant essay in The Baffler, it's a genre perpetually revising itself, not just in recent times, but almost since the beginning. Um, in that beginning, it was uh, seemingly the most rudimentary of genres, uh, but it has turned out to be maybe the most protean. It began, you, you might say, as a, a piling up, almost an accidental accretion of recollection, hearsay, legend, fabrication, abandoned mining camps, antique wanted posters, Albert Bierstadt landscapes. And it ended up seeping into the whole culture. When we talk about Westerns, we're referring not just to books or movies, but to a whole catalog of cultural paraphernalia that flourished for much of the 20th century. And that uh, certainly at mid-century, uh, was an extraordinarily dominant presence in the culture. Radio and TV shows, pulp magazines, comic books, children's toys, theme parks, songs, such as the ones we've just heard. Anything from Vaughn Monroe singing Ghost Riders in the Sky to Gene Pitney singing The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. The works collected in these Library of America volumes take us from the 1940s to the 1970s. They build and they comment on a tradition that was already long, going back to Bret Hart's Gold Rush stories, Ned Buntline's uh, mythologizing sagas uh, like Buffalo Bill, the King of the Border Men. And then in the early 20th century, Owen Wister's The Virginian, Zane Gray's Riders of the Purple Sage, which established templates for a romance of the Wild West which for readers far from the frontier provided a fantasy of strenuous living and heroic challenges, stampedes, blizzards, ambushes, range wars. The movies got into Westerns early and they stayed there. If you look at D.W. Griffith's The Massacre from 1912 or John Ford's Straight Shooting from 1922, all the elements are there and most especially the physical elements, the land, the rock formations, the people and horses moving through those spaces and the extraordinarily stark and vivid presence uh, of those elements. From then on, Westerns were the bread and butter of the studios, offering the simplest and most bracingly direct of pleasures, whether a fistfight on the roof of a stagecoach or a horseman crossing a plane at full gallop. And their popularity was worldwide. This was far from a purely American phenomenon. Westerns were loved uh, in many places, imitated in many places, and engendered many variant uh, forms. The ravines, the mesas, the deserts were alternate spaces for the imagination to wander in, spaces offering both freedom and danger. And in a landscape where there's nowhere to hide, human behavior was exposed in its most elemental forms. This brings us in a way to the novel and movie that signaled a somber turn in the development of the Western, the first of the novels collected in the Ron Hansen anthology, Walter Van Tilburg Clark's The Oxbow Incident. And with that turn, a new era kicks in for the Western, which would lead into its heyday roughly from the end of World War II into the 1970s. Uh, and then, well, we can talk about where, where it went after that. Uh, but to begin with, I, I'd like to ask uh, each of the panelists, um, what was it, do you think, that, that drew you to this genre in the first place? Or what is it that continues to uh, fascinate you about it? Just choose up, or and who to go? Who goes first? Oh, uh, sorry, Gene, go <laughs> ahead. Um, well, it, it's sort of an accident of, of birth, I guess, because uh, you know I I was of the first TV generation, and most of what populated the television set, beside the cartoons and the kiddie shows, 
were Westerns and not just the movies. Uh, Primetime television was awash in them, uh, particularly from the mid 50s to I guess the late 60s or thereabouts. Um, but there were all kinds of things that could affect you from watching those things. And, and it didn't matter where you grew up, whether you were in a housing project, whether you were in a suburban subdivision, whether you were living with people of various ethnicities or, or living completely in your own neighborhood, uh, what you stared at and what was staring back at you when you watched a Western was possibility, immense, previously unimaginable possibility for, as you say, getting into getting into all kinds of different uh, adventures. And you and you, it, it's sort of, those are the things that kind of triggered you to make your own inventions upon mm. whatever you were watching. Um, it, I don't know who said it once, but I think that so someone said that jazz and the Western were two of the most indelible American creations uh, in, 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 in the world's art forms. And um, if they have anything in common, at least obviously, uh, it's, it's the willingness that they do to sort of cause the people who watch them to complete what they set off in your head. Uh, at least that was for me anyway, the possibility. Yeah. It was everything, movies, TV, you name it. When you, when you mentioned jazz, I can't help thinking of that Sonny Rollins album cover. Yeah, West, absolutely. Out West, where he's in absolutely. the desert with his horn. It uh, made sense. It made sense. Uh, Imogen? I'm about, oh, sorry. Uh, well, so um, I can go next since I have a kind of very different story. I did not grow up with Westerns. I don't think I saw any of them as a child. And when I was a budding cinephile as a teenager, Westerns were sort of the green eggs and ham of movie genres for me. You know, they, I was, I had the usual kind of, um, you know, liberal and perhaps culturally snobbish prejudices against them. Didn't think I would like them, then completely fell in love with them when I did start watching them. And, you know, of course I quickly discovered that they're far more diverse, complex, ambivalent than the sort of um, assumptions that are, are sometimes made about them. But what really I fell in love with, I think, was them mostly aesthetically. Um, the, the spaces, the, um, I love, you know, the, the ritualism of them, the sort of familiar rhythms, that ballad-like quality that they have, um, and the, their wonderful cinematic quality. Um, and so I kind of loved your bringing up jazz and thinking about the way that Westerns are so much sort of standards and variations. You know, there are these things we always want to come back to when we want to see this, this sort of classicism of them, but they also can go in very radical directions. And I love the way sometimes films that are very radical and very iconoclastic also still embrace these kinds of, of rituals. Um, so I've, the most of the um, sort of writing that I've done on Westerns and, and my interest largely lies in that, in the sort of the psychological Western, the Western noir as a sort of post-war phenomenon. But um, that's not really actually what brought me into the genre. It was really just um, the, the stylization. I feel like this doesn't get an, as enough attention in terms of the movies because people are very concerned to talk about the content and the historical and mythological aspects of that, but they're, it's such a wonderfully stylized genre. And so it really appealed to me cinematically, first of all, I think. Yeah, and the stylization is odd. I mean, when I think of, you know, childhood TV, <coughs> I mean, already the Lone Ranger with the mask and all of these Western heroes with these very elaborate uh, garb uh, he was, was already a signal that this, you're not in the realm. <laughs> yeah. The ultimate. I mean, it, yeah, I, I think in, in my case, I mean, I'm about the same age as Gene, the same age as, as, as you, Jeffrey. Um, it was that early exposure. It was partly through TV. Um, but as, as I think back on it now, I feel lucky to have been able to see a lot of these movies on giant screens in mm -hmm. movie theaters, um, in 
usually good prints. Um, and uh, and and just how beautiful they were. Um, I, you know, I've, I've often thought that horses are the best justification for the invention of the movies. Uh, they just they are just as cinemagenic as anything on God's earth. And uh, I also I also had the the advantage of my father loved westerns, um, and he and it made no sense. Uh, he was, you know, a an Irish American Catholic linguist from New Hampshire, uh, liberal Democrat, um, and and not the sort of you know right wing manly man that uh, that you know the Western the Western seemed to seemed to celebrate. Um, but he loved them, and um, and I think what he loved about them was the was the clarity, uh, was the the kind of the moral clarity, the um, the and the quiet of them. Mm. Um, I mean, for for a guy whose life was was language, he was actually pretty laconic himself. And you know, sometimes he'd go to the movies and um, and I'd ask him what he saw and how he liked it, and he said, and he'd say too much talk. Which is a weird thing for somebody who mm -hmm. spoke several languages, spoke and taught several languages. But uh, but he, you know, he respected that silence, and I I grew to respect that too. Um, and uh, and it and it, it was, in fact, a kind of a kind of bonding uh, with him. I mean, I'll never forget seeing Ride the High Country with him, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw an awful lot of westerns together and so and so yes there's something very personal about westerns for me uh -huh. and uh, and there's it's it's hard to explain in any rational way but and i know the unexamined life is not worth living but mm -hmm. the examined life is oh no well I'll, I'll, I, I'll look yeah. for his books uh that's that's totally fascinating um uh, I want to jump on a little bit on what you said about how you derive certain modes of behavior from watching these westerns. Because I think a lot of times, um, and this is sort of this is the sort of thing that gets very shaky when you're talking about the westerns in general. But you know, each of us kind of forms ourself forms a self in large part from what we absorb through popular culture, um, through through. And not just through the sounds or through the words or the catchphrases, but for modes of behavior. You know, how much how much is enough to be said at any given time? What yeah. do you say? How when do you act? And how do you keep yourself from acting too fast? I mean, it sounds silly to say this, but you know, um, if you're a kid watching, you know, have gun will travel, or just to take one example. Uh, you're paying attention to stuff like that. If you're not paying attention to it, it's having an effect on you. Um, and I think those things become, as Imogen says, ritualized, I think, in the culture, you know. Um, yes, and I think Westerns are so much about the scrutiny of performance, of, of yeah. the men in particular being subjected to this incredible scrutiny about even how do they walk? How do they stand? You know, how do you carry yourself and how do you act? And, you know, particularly then, you know, in something like Rio Bravo, which, you know, Howard Hawks is always all about people behaving, you know, performing for each other and bonding through these shared ideals of behavior. And Westerns are so much about that um, kind of, of performative, but also, you know, the sense that that kind of performance is really a deep insight into somebody's character. Um, and it's always about how you can bring that yeah. into these scenes that you have to walk into in the way that people in Westerns are always walking into some kind of scene where they're on the spot and they have to yeah. act. Well, I, I love the way, on the one hand, the Western, I mean, the, the lure of the Western in a way is this image of 
total freedom and all that space and the, you know the endless images of, of horsemen riding free across these open uh, spaces and then in the end it's always about people being trapped in extremely constricted situations that they have to somehow get out of so presumably out into freedom again uh, amazing how in, in all those mazes and all those desert landscapes so many people get cornered have you noticed that i mean <laughs> yeah there are a lot of people getting cornered out there and you're thinking really and all this well there's there's really oh. nowhere to hide yeah. though, in that kind of a landscape so yeah. people there's something about people being very exposed it's and obviously oh sorry no, go ahead, please. No, and and obviously the you know the 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 tension between you know freedom and you know individual freedom and you know the 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 good of the community, what what we think of as civilization, uh, or at least socialization, um, is one of the great themes, and it's it's a great theme of most of the best westerns, I'd say. Um, it's certainly. It's it's certainly there in uh, in the Oxbow incident. It's certainly there in uh, in Warlock in um, in a big way. Um, it's you well, know, it's, it's one of the central you know, of the mm -hmm. the ranchers versus the sodbusters. I mean that exactly. Um, Absolutely, that there's. I, I'm very fascinated by the ambivalence towards communities that we might think first of the sort of. John Ford idea of the sort of idealization of the community building, but there are so many corrupt towns and these kind of visions of, of communities that are very cowardly or where the community has to make some kind of decision. And then yes, the, the idea of the, these, the gunfighter who is this you know, lone individual who they sometimes need to draw on, but then he has to be expelled from the community. So there's always this kind of yeah. Yeah. Um, tension, as you say, between the individual and the idea of freedom, and then what is the, the value of community or the weakness of community, um, which is certainly a, one of the themes that I think keeps Westerns so relevant and so fascinating. It's the core, it's the core of Democrat, it's the democratic argument, isn't it? I and mean, isn't, that, isn't, that isn't that the, is that the democratic argument in essence? Yeah. Well, but, you know, also the fact that in all of these town westerns, whether it's high noon or I mean, there are so many, uh, the people that the hero is defending always seem to be not really worth defending since they're completely cowardly, yeah. corrupt, yeah. completely unwilling to put up a fight about anything. One of the things I most love about about Warlock is in the novel. It's mm. it's weaker in the movie, but in the novel there is there's there's so much shifting of the of the, the the popular view of you know what should be done particularly the the the, the hired gun clay blaisdell yeah um, who is who is kind of an empty vessel uh played by henry fonda in the movie um and uh, and you know but the the townspeople of the you know, unincorporated town of of warlock they don't know what to do. I mean, they don't know whether they want a vigilante. They don't know whether they want you know, a real sheriff. And they keep going back and forth as, as Blaisdell himself sort of, sort of acknowledges. Um, but, you know, it's like the, it's like the people in, in, in Coriolanus. I mean, they're, um, you know, they, they keep going back and forth. And I mean, it's, it's, it's it's kind of extraordinary to, uh, to to read, and you know, a lot of that sadly gets lost in the movie, which is which is pretty entertaining for for a lot of its length. But um, but but I miss well, it that. only pieces of the book. Yeah, I mean that, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, yeah the the greatness of that book, which is certainly my favorite. Western novel is that it's told through these different perspectives. It's a sort of mosaic yeah. approach where the different chapters follow different characters. And there is this sort of voice of the townspeople because there are sections that are actually diaries of this, you know, Henry Holmes Goodpasture, who is just this sort of 
almost Greek chorus like representative of the townspeople. Um, and, I, and yes, the Coriolanus is a great um, comparison because there's a sense in which this they want they want somebody, but there's no way that that the gunfighter they bring in can win because whatever he does, they're kind of going to turn against him in the end, even though they may rely on him. Unless, unless, like, himself. Shane, unless like Shane, he knows when to go. I mean, <laughs> Shane, Shane checks out before he's asked to go. If yeah. you know, he's, it's like, it's like, well, okay. it's that trope of he belongs to the dying breed of the yeah. lone yeah. gunslingers. So right. yes, get out of there. Uh, which is pretty much the way the movie of Warlock ends with uh, Bond uh, leaving the scene. But um, there's also a really interesting little, I mean, it, it's an incredibly cheap little movie called Man from Del Rio with uh, Anthony Quinn and Katie Horado, where Quinn is a, a Mexican gunslinger who comes to a nowhere town to get revenge on another gunslinger who shot a bunch of people uh, years ago. And he, Quinn has trained himself to be a great gunfighter precisely so he can kill this guy. And then the townspeople who are plagued with gunfighters ask him to be the sheriff. And he takes it as a great honor. And, uh, and Katie Hurado, who works there says, these people have, you think these people love you or respect you? They, you know, they need your gun, so they're making you sheriff. And he finds this out, I mean, that, that he's socially ostracized, nobody wants to talk to him. And he finally gets drunk and gets into trouble. And um, well, it goes on from there. But um, it, it's a fascinating movie because you have the two central characters are Hispanic, which is rare in yeah. Westerns. Uh, but it's essentially, it's the same storyline. Uh, and of course, you know, one of these, probably shot in 10 day uh, budgets on a, you know, one block set of the West, the standard Western town. But, yeah. Another very similar movie is Man with the Gun with Robert Mitchell, oh, yeah. which is another with the, the, the town brings him in to clean up, you know, because they're, they're plagued with this, one of these kind of, you know, tyrannical ranchers who just, you know, it, is sending his men to run amok in town and they bring him in but then as soon as he starts killing people they want to back off and you know it's it's this constant like they need him but they don't want to have to get their hands dirty they want sort of him to do the dirty work but then he's this very ambivalent or ambiguous very morally ambiguous character who seems um you know to have his own uh sort of as is typical of, of Westerns of this era, his own sort of pathology around violence. And he's a very kind of traumatic, traumatized, damaged character. And, and again, a very, very short kind of black and white, low budget movie, but that really pinpoints that theme very well. It's, it's, when you mentioned trauma, I mean, cause that, you know, watching Westerns recently, I've thought about that a lot. Um, the kind of the traumatized characters uh and you know all these man. after the war i mean especially you know like samuel fuller's run of the arrow i mean look at mm -hmm. it now I and mean, it just seems totally a movie about uh ptsd that yeah. rod steiger is this completely damaged character who's been in the war for years and has seen his whole family get killed and just basically doesn't know what to do with himself and the whole movie is just him trying to abandon his identity and trying to become a Sioux and declare war on the United States. And, um, and then it kind of resolves itself, but in the most, well, typical Samuel Fuller strange way. But, uh, but given Fuller's own war experience, uh, it really seems to be, you know, maybe even more than his war movies, a, a kind of extreme statement of, of that kind of mentality well he's one of those guys Fuller's one of those guys you believe him when he talks about violence and it's after yeah, yeah. you know he's been there you know and it's 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 it's, it's different um it's funny that with with oh, go ahead oh, go ahead terry. Go ahead, terry no i'm just gonna say I mean, it's funny listening to jeffrey talk about all the motivations of you know the steiger character and his ptsd obviously and uh, in run of the arrow it's it's 
notable. I mean, having, since I've read a lot of Elmore Leonard and have thought a lot about Elmore Leonard and his, he hated motivations. Um, he was as anti-psychological, I think, mm. as the, as any Western artist or any writer of any kind could uh, could possibly be. I mean, he, he, to the end of his life, almost to the end of his life, you know, he got two terrific movies in the 50s out of, out of two of his short stories. Uh, Three Ten to Yuma became a terrific, almost perfect Western yeah. uh, directed by Delmer Daves with, um, with uh, Glenn Ford and, uh, and Van Heflin. And the Tall T, which is based on uh, by uh, the Bud Bedecker film with Randall Scott and Richard Boone, and uh, and he, he got these two terrific movies, and as I say, until very late in his life, when he apparently came to terms with the idea that movies are a little different uh, from from Western short stories, um, he always said that they just proved to him how movies screwed up perfectly good stories. Yeah, and yeah. and what he disliked was backstory you know i mean these were these were short stories they needed to be filled out a little bit right to uh to to make yeah. a feature just the fact that a guy was a deputy sheriff who needed a couple of hundred bucks and and took on this dangerous the dangerous job of taking taking a criminal to the train um that was enough for for elmore what more motivation do you need? Um, you do your job, you collect some money, and uh, which is pretty much his approach to writing in those days as well. That's really- I love it. I gotta say, I'm so glad that that volume is in Library of America now. Uh, I, I always thought they belonged there. <laughs> That's really interesting because of course that that era when, and I, I absolutely love both of those movies um, and I love the Westerns of Delmer Daves, but that whole era is, was so much about bringing psychology into mm -hmm. the Western. And there are a lot of kind of explicitly very Freudian stories like, you know, Pursued and all of these movies about people with some kind of trauma in their, their past that they're trying to move beyond usually by, you know, some kind of revenge that they think is gonna cleanse them of this trauma and all of, of you know, Anthony Mann's Westerns are very much about that. So it's, it's interesting that he just really, uh, obviously that was the opposite of, of his approach. But before we move on too far, I just, I had to, because we brought up Sam Fuller, I mean, I just had to say how much his West, he made some of the most interesting, unusual yeah. Westerns. They're all very different from each other, but um, you know, I shot Jesse James, which is where his protagonist is Robert Ford. And it's very much this film about the way the West is sort of becoming this reenactment of itself, even as it's still happening. And he, he tries, you know, um, reenacting the killing on stage. And, you know, this, he, this ballad is written about him that he hears in a bar room. And so it's, it's a fascinating idea of the West kind of already becoming mythologized and drifting away from reality, even in the moment. Um, and then of course, 40 Guns, which is one of the great yes. you know, female centric Westerns with Barbara Stanwyck and um, a completely kind of bonkers, but wonderful movie and really beautifully made. And um, I don't know, I love those, those very overheated uh, melodramatic 50s westerns which which one of the advantages of which was that many of them did bring women from the periphery into the center of stories things like Johnny Guitar and, Johnny Guitar. and yeah. um, so yeah. just wanted to say something about yeah well the stories. standoff between John Crawford and Mercedes McCambridge is I think still unique in the not uh, not even the, the first Distaff gunfight, though, because Woman They Almost Lynched, which is from a couple of years earlier, this yeah. also completely crazy Alan Dwan Western. Well, uh, Audrey yeah. Totter and Joan Leslie have a walking down Main Street 
you know, showdown shootout. And it's in this town with a female mayor and, you know, the outlaws are women. <laughs> it's set sort of during the civil war. And there's almost this idea that the town has been taken over by women because all of the men are gone. So, um, Alan yeah. Dwan made some That's really wild amazing. westerns late in his career. I mean, he made a lot of westerns early in his career that are mostly lost. But uh, talk about variations on a theme. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's, that's speaking of women in westerns. Everybody familiar with tribute to a bad man? Yes. Um, you know, I've never seen not seen when it. you that's that's well, the it's a Robert. It's a Robert Wise movie. Um, from a Jack Schaefer story, a very good Jack Schaefer, Jack Schaefer who wrote Shane. Um, and the woman in it, um, who is the, uh, the mistress, the common law wife, essentially, of James Cagney, is Irene Pappas. And it is, at first, Kind of gobsmacking to see uh, to see Irene Pappas in a western. It was sort of her first significant role in 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 a movie, and she brings such tremendous complexity and gravitas to the uh, to the you know the little woman role, and mm. uh, and she's and she's going toe to toe with Cagney, um, and they are clearly thoroughly enjoying. Uh, acting with one another in their different but but in some ways equally powerful styles because they're both kind of gestural actors and they're both big you know uh, they both go for the big lyrical emotions and it's just it's just a joy to watch and um, it's it's a it's a somewhat routine western in in some ways but um but Cagney and Pappas together right. in. I will look for that one that that's do look for it. it it's not it's not all that it, well known and I'm probably overselling it but um but you will not be disappointed in that I'm, I'm always looking for more 50s westerns there you go since go so um now we didn't talk too much about other novels. I don't know. Are there are other books that. Uh, well, we were having kind be, of an uh, interesting conversation while we were waiting for this to start about the searchers and the experience of reading the novel, the searchers. Of course, all of us are very familiar with the movie, but um, it is a really interestingly different experience to read the novel. Um, well, yeah, the characterizations. Yeah. The characters, characters are very different. Um, the, the sort of perspective and the focus is very different and it's kind of tonally different, even though sort of overall, it's, oh, it's essentially the same story, but. Um, well, well different, different things I think are being worked out in, in both the movie and the novel. Um, clearly, I mean, the very first time I, I mean, like a lot of people, the first time I saw The Searchers was like at least 20 years after it was made. And I didn't give a thought of, I didn't see it when I was younger. But by that time, I was already familiar with John Ford and everything that made up John Ford's work, speculations on his psyche, certainly mm -hmm. stuff about his own um, biases or alleged biases. Um, and and from the time you, I saw it, I was aware of the things that were being worked out in his attitudes towards, through John Wayne, the Ethan Edwards character, the, the attitudes towards the Indian, to the possibility that one of his own relatives could be turned into an Indian and what that meant. Um, and wh whether, whether she had to die or be forsaken because of that. All the stuff was being sort of thrown out there. The novel um, by Alan LeMay is, is, is sort of, I, I don't wanna say matter of fact about those, those factors, but it almost, it internalizes all those things. Well, the character does not have the obsessive force no, that mm -hmm. Wayne brings no, to it. No, he doesn't, but 
But when you're reading the book, it somehow makes the things that that is that are thrown out there in such a big passionate lump more vivid in a, in a weird way in the book because so many of the things that are so demonstrative in the novel are internalized and I think the word I used was particularized particularly in the depiction of the different tribes and how they went about how they actually exchanged or interacted with different aspects of the white community. <clears throat> there were different white communities there. It wasn't just mm -hmm. these settlers and, and there, there were Quakers, you know, yeah. intervening, intervening with between the settlers and the Indians. There, the and military, the different- There's different, a whole section with well, the common exactly. sheriffs, the the common traders. Sheriffs, that interaction. Um, and, and, he, and, and the fact that he does this without wasting, without a wasted word in relatively little time I mean, I was I was stunned by how I don't want to say relatively immaculate it was, but it it crystallized a lot of things for me that the movie just kind of left in different in different places. It, I must confess, it's not my favorite John Ford movie. I admire it, but if, but I but I I will I may be able to tell you later what my real favorite John Ford movie western is, but um, I. It, it really made me want to go back to the movie again and, and view it with that novel, with what I got from the novel, framing uh, the things that mm -hmm. I first saw half dozen times the first time, you know? I mean, yeah. Well, that's a great point about Ford sort of making it into what he was interested in because the, the, key, the thing is the protagonist in the book is Martin Pauly. Yeah. And Ford was obviously just not interested in him. You know, he just turns him into this kind of one dimensional young sidekick. Um, but the book is really about his journey and, and this almost sort of coming of age story about what happens to him over the years that he spends, you know, on the plains and everything. And also much um, more about the fact that he was the survivor of an Indian massacre. And right. The details. Thanks. And it's about his feeling about Debbie and his sort of sense of guilt and, and his, his love for her, which the, his, the yes. omen that he sees in all of this. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank God Jeffrey Hunter didn't have to carry the movie. <laughs> oh now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I mean I, I, I like the book a lot because I think the ending makes better sense. Yes. Yeah. Spoiler alert, it is different. Mm -hmm. from Agreed. The movie. Agreed. Agreed. Sometimes the opposite is true in some of these adaptations. But, Indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the yeah. ending is where is is where, where changes are made from, you know, yeah. from from page to screen. <laughs> it's it's almost invariably towards yeah. the end. Right, right. Um, when you read, you know, it's funny when you mentioned Warlock and the movie and everything else. I had the same feeling. I mean, I read Warlock after I saw the movie, and much like I read The Searchers after I'd seen the movie. Mm. When, and in both cases, I read them and I immediately wanted to make another movie out of both of them. I immediately mm -hmm. wanted to recast Warlock to do some of the things, Imogen, that you were referring to and, and, and get at some of the things that the first version doesn't get to. I, I, was, I was imagining, this, this tells you when I was reading it, I was thinking, Sam Shepard is Clay Bladesell, of course. You know, I was thinking, and I was-, I was Yeah, well, Warlock seems really destined for another era of yeah. filming. Yeah. yeah, it needs to be a many series. Mm -hmm. Same with this, and the same with and the same with this one. I was thinking, what if who, who would I put as a Martin Lawrence set as the centerpiece of this book? Mm -hmm. It was just uh, it's interesting how that process mm -hmm. of, of, of getting of getting at the, at the original work kind of sets in motion. You know your own variations. So, what is your favorite John Ford? Book? John Ford. <laughs> I'm a my darling Clementine man myself. Uh -huh. I've, 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 I've liked the, I love the dialogue. I have, I have carried with me one of the greatest data exchanges of all time. Mac, you ever been in love? No, sir. I've been a bartender all my life. What does that mean? I don't it's, know, but I love it. Yeah. And I love I've, everything I've, that comes before and afterwards, you know? I so we go around the room. It's the only Ford film I can think of where that that the humor actually works for me. Humor yeah. to me is, is usually the, 
the, the flaw in, in a lot of Ford's movies, yeah. particularly The Searchers, I would say. Yeah. Um, but because totally. he, Henry Fonda, especially who has that wonderful deadpan, you know, comic gift and, yeah. you know, the whole bit with the, with the, you know, people, the desert flowers and, yep. you know, no, that's me you know, when he's got the hair oil on. It's so, yes, I love it. And, and the, you know, great Victor Mature performance, Absolutely. Shakespeare Absolutely. scene and everything. So I would, I think I would agree. Mm. And, and, yeah. and I do too. Uh, it is well, also my favorite, uh, <laughs> my favorite Ford. I think he was, I have, it's clearly uh, as much of a departure from history as it is possible to be, but uh, Ford just did, he did myth a lot better than he did complexity. Um, and um, it, complexity just wasn't his thing, uh, but he could, he could mythicize the hell out of something. And, uh, and he sure does in My Darling Clementine. It's, it's, a, it's a pure, classic Western and who cares whether anything happened that way or not. And, 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 I'll, I'll put in a vote for Wagon Master, uh, which wow. <laughs> is, is the one that I probably watch more than any other uh, these days. Uh, just because it, to me, it's like, it's music and um, the, um, almost plotless. And it's just moving from one point to another and there, so there are evil people who just appear from nowhere and are destroyed. And aside from them, it's just moving from one place to another with music playing. Uh, well, the t well, tied to what you were saying, Terry, about Elmer Leonard, it, 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 it strikes me that when Ford achieved his greatest effects when he wasn't trying so hard, including humor and including the kind of thing you had mentioned, Jeff, with you know, the Wagon Master's unadorned <laughs> You know, well, Wagon Master has some great humor, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, because I love Ben Johnson, and I regret yeah. the fact that he had a falling out with Ford, uh, because it would have been interesting if. Uh, and then there, thereafter, gave up his movie career for a while, um, because he 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 would have made a very interesting, you know, like the anti John Wayne, yeah, uh, an, an altogether different personality, yeah. So I see there's a question in the chat, Jeffrey. I don't know if you want to ah, okay. address this about younger filmmakers who've explored the Western and how they've updated it. We were also kind of chatting about that well, before we started. I, you're in a better <laughs> position to answer that. Well, I, I will just mention one. I mean, we were, we were kind of talking about this um, before this. Um, started and the ways that certain movies that are not explicitly Westerns are nonetheless clearly drawing on Westerns. Um, it's it's uh, the, the sort of formulas and, the, and the, the stylistic and thematic things we recognize turn up in many different ways and around the world. Um, I mean, that's obviously a phenomenon that's been going on for a long time, you know, back to things like your Jimbo and the Seven Samurai that you know then come back as Westerns. But I mean, just the one I would mention and maybe each of us might have some thoughts, but um, I'm thinking of a movie called Western by a German uh, filmmaker named Valeska Grisbach. It came out about three years ago, maybe. Um, and it's about a group of German workers who are in the wilds of southern Bulgaria building a, a water treatment plant. And it's just about their relationship with the local people, the dynamics of this group of men. The protagonist is a kind of loner outsider character. There is a, a white horse that plays a significant mm -hmm. part. And it's not, you know, the, the ways that she's using Western tropes are, are subtle. It's not. It's not really overt. Although obviously the title of the film points you in that direction. But um, that was a film I thought was really terrific and very successful in in kind of using these things that we love about the Western in a in in mm. subtle and original ways. Any other uh, thoughts on this? 
I'm completely blanking on younger filmmakers uh, making making westerns. Um, the last the last younger filmmaker who is no longer a younger filmmaker that I can think of is Catherine Bigelow making the vampire western uh, oh. near dark. There's, so there's also um, Meek's Cutoff by Kelly yes. Rogers. Yeah. Well, that's, yes. uh, yeah. Quite a quite a that's that's a good example film. of doing something. Mm -hmm. And quite different. First cow. Uh, Don't forget first cow. Which I loved. And I guess, yes, that is, and it's, it's certainly a frontier story. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to bring up one cross-cultural thing that not many people know about. We were talking about it earlier. Um, there's an African filmmaker who's, who's, who's since deceased. His name is, um, and I have to be sure I'm pronouncing it right, Idrissa Wedrago. Um, and he made a movie in 1990 called Tile, which is T-I-L-A-I. -I. Uh, it's translated, it means the law. It, he, was a, he was from Burkina Faso. And it's set in this very broad desert expanse. Um, there's a lone man coming home to his town, to his small village. Um, and uh, he's, he's, he's one of these strong silent types, doesn't say much but he, he's very much a man of action. And he, uh, he notices that his, in his long absence, his fiance has married his father in his absence. And uh, he, he's forced to move and live outside the town where he starts an affair with his fiance, now his father's wife. The father finds out about it. Uh, and there's all this, I mean, yeah, on the one hand, it's very domestic, but on the other hand, there are these different tropes about vengeance and and, mm. and and social custom and the law and everything else. And invariably, you know, some kind of, it all coalesces into some into some violent retribution. But I saw it when, you know, and I reviewed it for Newsday back then. And the first thing I thought of was, you know, John Ford comes to Africa or 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 even Sam Fuller, you know. I mean, this was uh, this had the same elemental uh, virtues and pleasures, to be honest with you, that I remembered from the Westerns that I saw growing up. And this was, again, in an unlikely part of the world, you would think, but it also shows just how far reaching <laughs> the influence of the Western is. So that's just- Well, I, 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 I think there's almost nowhere that it didn't reach. Um, and as we can certainly see from, uh, the European um, contributions. Uh, I mean, just at the moment when the Hollywood Western was kind of running out of breath, uh, along came the Italians with another decade at least of uh, often quite amazing films, uh, which which no one has brought up. I don't know if uh, that's... Well, the French, other than the French, the, I mean, one of the, one of the best westerns of the last two years was made by a French director, the Sisters Brothers, which I still have not seen. Oh, I I loved it. Uh, Jack Jacques, Jacques Odiard directed it, um, and it was such a surprise. I mean, I I walked in unprepared because mm -hmm. it didn't get a lot of attention, and what attention it got, uh, the box office was very low. It, it it did get a lot of critical praise. But I love that. I mean, it was, it had all the elements, even a little bit of surreality around the edges. And, uh, mm. you know, and he's not a young man. He's, he's like, he's like our age, um, Terry, he's, he's in our generation. But, you know, um, he gets it. He gets yeah. it. He gets it in very, you know, in a very, you know, subtly innovative way, but he gets it. Hello I'm back. Oh, hi, I'm back. Jeffrey, did you want to ask another question? I was going to, um, I mean, we're wine, it's getting toward the end. I was just, uh -huh. we're running out. I was going to say that um, a lot of, you know, people are loving this conversation and are very grateful for it. And they would be grateful for even more recommendations. I didn't know if you wanted to do one last like lightning round um, with everyone, you know, just suggesting like either one movie or one book or story, maybe underrated or whatever that they would you know, recommend to the people who are watching. I think, you know, we've all been stuck for a year streaming 
uh, you know, streaming text and, and streaming movies and people are, are um, you know, wondering what they might want to read or watch next. So I don't know, without putting people on the spot, would, you know, is, is there either a movie or, a, as I say, or a book or story that you would recommend to people? Well, I'll lead with actually with two, two movies that uh, I think are not quite as well known as, as they could be. Um, Flaming Star with Elvis Presley uh, in by far his best uh, dramatic performance, uh, very much in the in the line of the searchers and other uh, late 50s Westerns uh, about uh, race and ethnicity uh, in which Elvis Presley is the son of a Kiowa woman and a, a white settler. Uh, and has, at one point says, I don't know who's my people, which is kind of the whole movie. It's rather a violent film, in fact, and ends uh, surprise, on a surprisingly downbeat note. Um, and the other would be The Wonderful Country, uh, a very unusual Western with Robert Mitchum. Um, again, someone who's torn between uh, an American identity and a Mexican identity. So he, he killed someone when he was very young and fled to Mexico and essentially became Mexican and then through circumstances finds himself on the other side of the river. And the whole movie is just going back and forth across the Rio Grande uh, and, and getting into trouble on, on both sides, but beautifully shot. Um, and you got to see Satchel Paige in a, in a mm -hmm. bit part, his only. Uh, oh, wow. Yes, I, I love The Wonderful Country as well. And it also has Julie London. Um, it, was, it was produced by Mitchum as well as starring in it. Um, and I guess I will stay with Mitchum because he's one of my favorite actors, especially in Westerns. Um, I mean, I'd love to recommend Blood on the Moon by Robert Wise, although I know that that is so not the easiest movie to see, um, but that's a, a really wonderful, very classic example of the sort of post-war noir Western um, with a great performance by Mitchum, great, very dark cinematography. Um, and then I guess if I can, if I can have one, <laughs> one more, um, you know, I, I feel like the, the Westerns of Delmer Daves don't get enough attention except, you know, 310 to Yuma, which is certainly his masterpiece, but I'm extremely fond of, um, The Last Wagon with Richard Widmark as a, a white man who's been raised by the Comanche and, um, it's also a sort of post-trauma story, but it has spectacularly beautiful color, widescreen landscapes. And um, I don't know why it's not a better known film. Yeah, I, I love it. I, well, the landscapes with this are always quite remarkable. And if I can just mention, just <laughs> as we remember Bertrand Tavernier, he wrote a wonderful piece about Delmer Daves in Film Comment a few years ago called The Ethical Romantic, which is well worth seeking out. And he really analyzes how Daves uses the landscape. Yeah. Yep. Terry, do you have a recommendation? And since we have actually at this point mentioned Robert Wise more frequently than Sam Peckinpah, um, I feel like I, uh, I'm partly re responsible for that. I feel like I, I need to mention one of the lesser known peck and paws, which is The Ballad of Cable Hogue. Um, very gentle, funny, uh, lyrical, and very ballad like uh, movie that came out right after The Wild Bunch, the masterpiece, The Wild Bunch, and is just a lovely, a lovely piece of work. And while we're talking about Jason Robards, who was the star of uh, Ballad of Cable Hogue, uh, I'd also like to put in a little plug for John Sturgis's Hour of the Gun, which yes. is the aftermath of uh, the gunfight at the OK Corral. Mm -hmm. It is a much better movie than Sturgis's uh, gunfight at the OK Corral. It's got James Garner as Wyatt Earp and spectacularly uh, Jason Robards as Doc Holliday. Doc Holliday is an actor-proof part. Even Val Kilmer can do it. Uh, <laughs> And uh, but Robards is is just transcendently great in it, 
and the movie has this sort of drifting road movie melancholy to it that has always seemed to me to anticipate Pat Garrett, uh, Peck and Paws, Pat Garrett, and Billy the Kid um, in, in interesting ways. And, uh, and not enough people have seen Hour of the Gun. Yeah, that so, movie, I mean, a great movie. And for some reason, it, uh, yeah, it never caught on. People. Amazon Prime. I, I'm, I'm going to go uh, literary and cinematic. Uh, if whoever out there has not read Little Big Man, the book by Thomas Berger, do so immediately. Um, I don't have as much against the movie by Arthur Penn because I love Arthur Penn, you know, almost without qualification. But the but the novel is one of the great unsung American novels of the last half century. And uh, I recommend if you didn't read that, go to that. Now as for movies, um, I'm gonna go a little more contemporary uh, and a little more sideways because uh, this ran on cable back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. It's a movie by John Carpenter called El Diablo. And it stars Louis Gossett Jr. as this black cowboy uh, who it turns out was the inspiration by this hack, uh, hack writer, uh, I think he played by Joe Pantoliano, uh, for this white character in these Penny Dreadfuls. And Anthony Edwards plays this school teacher uh, who was a big fan of these hack mm -hmm. novels and is somehow aghast when he meets or runs into this black cowboy to realize that all the adventures happened with him. I mean, there's a real story bracing it that's very good. I mean, the, the whole thing is, it's, it has that kind of haphazardly, casually great ambiance that most good Westerns have. It has a kind of you know, storytelling sturdiness and everything else. But Gossett looks like he was born to play this guy. I mean, he is, he is he's, 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 he's such a, he has the same pleasure, you get the same pleasure watching him that you get watching Mitchum or, uh, or maybe Steve McQueen when he was playing Cowboys or, or you know, mm. Randolph Scott or any of those people. He has that same ease and it makes you think, boy, if history had been just a little different, if it had come mm -hmm. sooner or later, you know, it, it could have really affected. It is available, I think, on, uh, on, 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 DV, on DVD, and you can probably get it on Amazon Prime, but if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's, it's called I El Diablo. Will go El, Diablo. Diablo. El Diablo. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, one and all. Um, you have been listening to Jeffrey O'Brien, Terrence Rafferty, Gene Seymour, and Imogen Sarah Smith discuss the American Western. Uh, many of the works they mention, some of the works they mention, are found in two Library of America volumes. The Western, four classics of the 1940s and 50s, edited by Ron Hansen, and Elmore Leonard Westerns, edited by Terrence Rafferty. I hope you'll join us for forthcoming online events from Library of America. On Thursday, April 15, Richard Wright's daughter, Julia Wright, and grandson, Malcolm Wright, join best-selling writer, Kiese Lehman, to discuss a major literary event, Library of America's release next month of The Man Who Lived Underground, a previously unpublished novel by Richard Wright about race and police violence that publishers in the 1940s wouldn't touch. Details about this and other upcoming LOA Live events can be found on our website, LOA.org, where you'll also find information about Library of America's Westerns and Elmore Leonard volumes and links to purchase those and other volumes of great American writing. You'll also find recordings of tonight's and previous LOA live events. Thank you so much to all of our guests tonight and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>